I want to welcome all of you here tonight. And our topic tonight is how to survive the unexpected. Jeremy is on tonight, who is our guest. And I'm going to give him an opportunity now to introduce himself. I met him, had the opportunity to meet him um, on a Zoom. The first, first time I met him was on a Zoom. And then I got the actual opportunity to talk with him. And all of this is through our big friend, who I call the mayor, Michael Sturdivant. Hopefully he's on tonight. So uh, Jeremy, come on and um, tell us a little bit about yourself and then we'll get into this. Bishop, first off, thanks for having me on. Um, so yeah, I've been in the Army for 19 years now, I'm currently a major. Uh, you know, more than a decade of my service has been in the infantry and the special forces. Um, and, you know, you, you get survival training throughout that. I got survival training at several points throughout that decade. You know, so for those of you who aren't familiar with the infantry, you know, the infantry are your, you know, they're your foot soldiers. You know, they're the, you know, the men and women who, um, who fight your wars, you know. So with that, you know, you spend a lot of time moving from uh, place to place by truck or by foot and extended periods living out of your rucksack. Um, and then for the, the time that I spent in, a, in special forces, so with special forces units, you, know, you have to always be prepared to deploy on a moment's notice. Um, you know, the main mission there is, you know, with training and advising, you know, foreign forces and different tasks, but in the same manner, like uh, an infantryman, you know, living on your feet, living out of your, you know, living out of our rucksack. And, but, you know, as a, as a special forces officer, I had an opportunity to get even more extensive uh, survival training. I'm just hoping that I haven't, you know, hope we can pass a little bit of that knowledge on to, you know, to you and uh, to your parishioners tonight. Well, we appreciate it, man. And we, we, we want to say um, thank you for your service um and what you have done and all of your all your training and so um tonight i thought it was it, it was important for us to have this conversation tonight and um you know we prepare um to one day make it to heaven and um but while we're living here on earth there are certain things that we need to prepare for and some might be saying why are we having this conversation tonight um what are you expecting? Well, um, I'm expecting the unexpected. Um, none of us thought we would ever be where we are tonight, dealing in the middle of a, a global pandemic, dealing with COVID-19. Uh, never would have thought that we would see some of what we're seeing in the world today and, and how things are just moving and turning. And so um, it is important that we as a people, it's good to go to church, I love going to church. It's good shouting, preaching, and having a good time. But I think at the end of the day, there's some other things that, some valuable resources that we need to make sure that we got under our belt um, so we can use if there's a moment's notice that we have to pack up and roll out from wherever we're staying now for whatever reason. Um, you know, a lot of people talk about um, they're, they're preparing for the end times. And so I don't know what's going to happen. But my job is as a bishop, pastor, is to make sure that I give you the best um, uh, opportunity to get as much information and knowledge as possible. So we're on tonight and um, we're gonna dialogue. And, and, and first question I want to, to throw out tonight to, to Jeremy is, um, we're living in some volatile times and, um, I don't have to tell you this, but there's a lot of racism out and we're, we're seeing people marching here and we're seeing them marching there and, and, and they got weapons. And, um, so if you had to talk to us tonight about if something was to happen, if we're trapped in our homes, now I know we're here for COVID-19, for quarantine, but if something breaks out in the street and um, either we're trapped at our home because of what's breaking out in the street, or we have to get up for a moment's notice and move from where we are, tell us what we should do, what we should look for, and how we should be prepared. Yeah, again, so, you know, as we were speaking earlier in the week, I think uh, it's really good that you 
and you know the members of your church are having this conversation. I think the first thing that you that you know the first thing that comes to my mind when it comes to planning, of course, you got to have a plan for you know how you're going to survive and you know and, and what that looks like. But I think most importantly, the first thing you got to do is answer like, hey, you know, if you need to move, where are you going to go? Right, and I think that is probably the most that's the most critical question and it's, it's something that you got to think a lot about and I think that's going to be different for everybody um, you know really no right or no right or wrong answer um, I, I think it really depends on you know what resources you have at your disposal um, I think you know as a church I mean I think the question being you know hey so is the church a viable spot you know can we meet at the church and can we survive from the church you know, is it a family member that's located nearby or is a family member that's located in another state? You know, I know when I think about, and you know, there have been there have been plenty of times where we've had to, you know, pick up and move. Think about it in the case of, uh, uh, you know, inclement weather. If, uh, you know, if a hurricane or something is gonna come through and displace you, you know, you all know that you have that family member, um, you know, like for me is my family back home in Louisiana. If something were to happen here, I know, you know, my first plan, if I can do it, is I'm going to, I know I have a safe space there. Um, so you can't over, you know, like I said, you can, I can't put enough emphasis on just for one, knowing where you're going to go and putting some thought behind that, if that makes sense. Yep. And so, so having a plan, knowing where you're going to go. So um, what should we be prepared to have if we have to move at a moment's notice? Um, let's just say, um, now I'm from Louisa County. I'm from I'm from the country, and from where I am in Gainesville, Virginia, it's about an hour and fifteen minutes. Mm -hmm. And uh, we have um, land, we have property, we have family there. So if 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 I had to get up and roll out, I know I have a place to go to. Right. Um, but I don't know what I'm going to encounter from the time that I leave my house to where I'm trying to get to. Right. So. It might take me, based on whatever is happening, it might take me one day, it might take me two days, even though right now it's a it's an hour and a half drive, but based on um, what's going on at the particular time, I need to make sure, or we need to make sure that we have enough to survive with while we're on the road trying to get to from point A to point B. Right. So... You know, the first thing, you know, the first note that I'll make is, you know, anytime we're going to do, you know, if I, I think back, you know, anytime I was going to go out on a mission, anytime I knew I was going to be out for an extended period of time. And I know in the case of, you know, I know in your scenario, you're saying, okay, something happens and, you know, you just have to move at a moment's notice. I think, like I said, that's why I think this is a discussion that you're having is so important because survival really starts before then. <laughs> like survival starts right. right now with the conversation that you're having and it really starts with a risk assessment and you know when I think about you know assessing your level of risk like I said it is different for everybody you know because a lot of it it depends on where you are where you're located we speak you know specifically here to Virginia um you know when I speak when I think about a risk assessment yeah so a risk assessment has two parts right so you know you want to look at you're going to you know you're going to consider how probable you, know, you you have all these different things that could happen and you can just use your imagination on, you know, you know, the what if scenario. But generally speaking, you know, you, you want to plan for the things that are most probable, first off, and the things that are most severe. And I think those are the two aspects of risk that you need to begin your plan with. And then, you know, you tailor your plan off of that. So now you're talking about now things have happened you know, you're going to need to displace from your home. Uh, we need to move to, you know, whatever area of land that you have in another location. Well, then I think again, so one of the things I sent you over was a, you know, was a packing list. And we can kind of run through that, what that looks like. Anybody who served in the military has seen this. You know, you, you generally know you're going to have, a, you know, you have your bag that's waiting by the door, that's waiting in your garage or whatever. And you know, you have those things that is packing with if you're going to go out, you know, generally speaking, if we're going to go out and do some type of field activity, you know, we start with this packing list. No, it, and, the, and the purpose of that is that, you know, you want to be able to live out of that for, you know, 48 to 72 hours, you know, two to three days. Um, and the reality of it is that, you know, you just can't plan for everything. 
You know, you try to have enough on you to live those two to three days and to get you to a point where, you know, you can then make a better plan, make more of a long-term plan, if that makes sense. Uh, so if you want to walk through those things, we can walk through that now. We can Let's do that. Uh, so I have to share my screen with you. Like I said, I put together some slides and so can you see what I have here? I can see it. Okay. You know, so everything that I have on this list here, and I'll send this over to you. I'll email this to you when we're done. Um, but everything that's on this, on this, uh, on these slides and on this list that I'll send you, you know, you put this, if you put these things together, you know, the idea is that you can pick up this backpack. So for one, you know, this is an idea of a backpack that you'll want to have. Uh, like these are just your standard, um, hiking backpacks. Um, you want to make sure that you have a pack with enough room, you know, things like, you know, comfort are going to be a factor if you're having to move over long distances. So you want to make some, you know, the key thing is making sure that you have something that you're going to, that's going to have, you know, padded straps like the ones here on the screen uh, on these have. And, you know, as you see, they have different ranges of prices that do different things and you just have to find what works within your budget. Um, but really any backpack will work, but I give you these as an example because these are the type of backpacks that we'll use, you know, when we're, so if I were going out on a mission, it would look something like, particularly this one on the left, you know, a, a hiking backpack, you know, it's got a zipper up top so that I can quickly get to whatever my important items are. Um, it's got spots for water and other things I need to get to quickly. Um, and then it's just something that I can move in for a long period of time and it's not going to, you know, cause undue strain on my back or, or, or whatever, or whatever else. Um, you know, the next thing that I had on, let me see here. You know, the next thing I have a filtration mask. You know, again, you know, planning for the unexpected. Like I said, you just never know. And as you see right now, I think everybody's getting comfortable, comfortable with the mask. But generally speaking, like I said, um, you know, we talk about like the survival rules of three. You can survive with, you can only survive for about three minutes without air. Uh, three hours without shelter in, you know, extreme climates. So think like extremely hot, extremely cold, you know, three days without water, three, three, uh, three weeks without food. So those are, so, you know, those are the basic rules of survival that you want to start off with. Uh, some people, I, you know, again, I don't know how folks feel about a mask, but I think it's always a good thing to have. And as you can see here, you can get them for, you know, rel relatively cheap. You can get, you know, a, a large pack of masks at this point for about 10 bucks. You know, next thing we have here is we have a, uh, we have a survival tent. Uh, you know, these are, you know, highly portable tents, you know, protect you against the weather, protect you against the elements. You know, I found these two right here, you know, look highly rated on Amazon and it costs about, costs about 20 bucks. Now, you know, obviously it leads me to another point, you know, we can do all of this planning and planning is great, but I'll just make a quick note on, you know, a plan is nothing without rehearsal. Right, so making sure that you take the time to go out and know how to use this equipment is key. And I think, you know, that's probably another thing for another session once we're outside of COVID, right? How to, you know, you know you'll certainly get, you know, more benefit out of knowing how to set one of these up, knowing how to tear it down, knowing how to pack these things. And we can certainly do that, you know, in the future. But uh, like I said, this is an idea of what you're gonna need. This is an idea of what that, like I said, a survival shelter will look like. Here are just thermal blankets. You know, these are lightweight thermal blankets, keep you warm. Um, Cause you, you know, it, it would be nice if you think you're gonna you know, have a quilt or have a, have a blanket, but those things get heavy, right? So if you're moving from place to place, you know, especially if you're going to have to move over a long distance, then weight becomes a factor. So you want to make sure that whatever you have is also lightweight. Um, and these are, these are lightweight, you know, they're very effective at keeping you warm. Um, like I said, just a regular run of the mill thermal blanket, as you can see, like right here on Amazon and you can order a, you can order a box of these for $4. So, you know, none of these things on the list are really expensive. I think this whole list that I'm going to walk you through 
Um, again, I know everybody has a different budget, you know, but you can really put one of these things together, you know, using things around your house, maybe needing to order some specialty hours, but you should be able to get it for under 150 bucks in total, you know. So these are, uh, so these are bladders, you know, you're going to need to have something to keep water, obviously. Uh, I personally, I've used these bladders at plenty of times in the past. I like them because um, when I'm not carrying water, you can just roll it up and then you can stick it in your pocket. You can stick it in your bag. And again, like I said, it, it lightweight, you know, no weight at all. So, and it also helps you conserve space. Whereas a bottle is just another clunky thing that, you know, you're going to have to like tie onto your bag or stuff down in your bag or try to find a way to carry it in your hand. But then that's that, you know, if you're having to move, if you're having to move quickly, then like I said, you're going to need your hands free potentially, you know, depending on where you are, depending on the situation. Right. So, you know, my recommendation, you know, Platypus is a good company here. They make a really good, uh, they make a really good uh, bladder, but like Nalgene bottles and things like that work fine. You know, little tricks of the trade is that, you know, if you're going to use a bottle for some reason, if you prefer to use something like that, getting a way to clip it onto your, uh, getting a way to clip it onto your backpack is something that we use to also preserve space. Um, really whatever works for you, but this is what I recommend. Next thing on water, you know, not only having somewhere that you're going to store water, but the reality of it is that, you know, if you really get into a situation where you have to survive, then, you know, you're probably going to be in a position where um, the water that you're getting isn't going to be what you, is not the water that you're getting out of your fridge or a bottle of water. And it's certainly not, like I said, it's probably could, could be potentially worse than the water that you're getting out of the tap, right? So that's why water filtration is important. You know, depending on where you're moving, you may have a pond or, you know, so, you know, one survival tip is that you want to try to get your water from, you know, moving sources, water that is moving. So like a, a stream or something, generally you don't want to get, you don't want to, you know, get water from steel sources. But, you know, something like this, obviously you'll have to read the instructions and learn how to use. But, you know, water filtration is one of those things that are going to be very important to survival. Because again, like I said, you can, you know, you can only go about three days without water. And if it gets bad enough, you're going to need to try to find that from, from somewhere. Um, then another option, anybody, like any, any, any person who's served in the military has seen these, you know, these iodine, iodine tablets. You know, you can just take one of these tabs if you don't have one of the, the high tech, you know, water filtration gizmos. And you can just take an iodine tablet, put it in your water you know, let it sit for a few minutes, shake it up. And then you're, like I said, then you're good to go. Then your water is, your water is good to drink, it's potable. Um, so made extensive use of these tabs over, over the course of my career being in the military. And as you can see, like I said, you can get a bottle of these for about $8, really cheap, but another survival necessity. I know I'm kind of going on, uh, Bishop. Do I need to stop and field any questions? Or you just want me to just keep? Do we have any here? questions? If not, we'll keep rolling. I don't see any. There's none on the on the chat, so let's keep rolling, and we'll we'll circle back around if we have to. Okay. And yeah, I'm just checking off of my. This isn't exactly in the order I have it on my sheet here. Let's see. So next thing is, you know, again, how you're going to get food, right? So we're all at different, you know, some folks grew up hunting and fishing, right? So, you know, in terms of food, you have a few different options, you know, and I, you know, if you're able to plan ahead, um, you know, generally speaking for military, we have what's called these, you know, MRE, our meal ready to eat. So they don't taste the best. Some of them taste pretty good, but you know, they don't taste the best, you know, just prepackaged food, um, you know, non-perishable stuff that you can take and, you know, you can pack it in your bag. Um, so I didn't put those up because the Amazon was selling those at a pretty high price, but the bottom line is, you know, any, 
you know, any, you can, you can use any non-perishable food, right? Something like, you know, you can use, maybe use granola bars. So you can tailor it to what you like. But again, the goal is you want to make sure that you pack enough of whatever it is that you're going to eat to try to, like I said, try to last you for, for two to three days, you know, while you're getting where you're going. All right. So we have one question in the mm -hmm. chat is how, how long does the water last or how, how long is it good in a bladder? So, you know, I think, one, you know, once your water is potable, like I said, once you've treated it, then it's good. You know, it, it, you know your water is not, now it may be, it may not be good for your taste, I would say, you know, but generally speaking, like I said, if you're in a situation where you're having to survive and you're moving on your feet, then you're going to be drinking a lot of water. So, okay. you know, that doesn't really come into, that doesn't really become a factor, you know, but, you know, that's a good question because it leads me to the point of, you know, you want to make sure that you're drinking you know, at least a gallon a day, you know? So I think those, uh, you know, those uh, bladders are a quart, I want to say. So I think you want to be drinking about four of those throughout the day as you're moving. Uh, you know, you're, you know, generally, you know, if, if it's hot, if it's hot, you know, and you're in a position where you have to move, you're going to be sweating a lot. So most of our, what we call heat casualties, but you know, whether it be, you know, guys, you know, so heat exhaustion, cramps, you know, dry, salty skin, um, you know, all of those things that for anybody who has first aid training, you know, is well aware of the different, you know, issues that you can have from the heat, you know, is one of those things that kind of sneaks up on you. So we always tell me, don't wait until it's too late to start drinking water. <laughs> you know, you can start drinking water early. Right. Uh, so, like, if, if you if you start drinking water early and if you start drinking slowly throughout the day, I, I don't think you will get to a point where the the water's just sitting in your bladder, in, in your water bladder, or your water bottle, and not using it. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Um, so what I have here. So, like I said, the best thing is if you can prepare your food ahead of time then do that but there's always a case where you can't right so that's where it's just going to come up on you know what you learn you know what you know you know if you're able to hunt then going out and hunting hunting and sourcing your own food um you know i say risk assessment a lot of these, a lot of folks say it's crazy because you know the reality of it like here in virginia then you know you're going to be able to get food you know at least in the initial stages and you know if you think about like you know, I'm no doomsday prepper, you know, but I'm just trying to give you, you know, like what, you know, what the reality is, is going to look like, you know, you're going to, you know, you're going to go to the store, you know, you're going to find food, you know, but if there's ever a place, if there ever comes a point where, okay, I, you know, we've ravaged everything, there's nothing on the shelves, I've got to go out and get my own food, which a number of, uh, you know, my friends and I were discussing at the early points of COVID, particularly the guys I know who are in the South and the Midwest. Well, you know, these guys grow up hunting and fishing, you know, you know, they have their gun collection. So, you know, these guys are going to eat. So, I mean, you know, so the bottom line is, you know, whether you can hunt, you know, this is a fishing, you know, this is a portable fishing kit. You know, I think I recommend another thing is getting like a, uh, you know, a fishing net, something that you can just like, we've used those before. We'll just let them leave them out um, in the water. And that's also really effective, you know, fishing off of these lines um is really effective so but again putting thought behind like you know looking at the skills that you have or the folks in your group or the folks in your household and thinking in advance of okay you know what are we going to do in this situation how are we going to get food okay so we got another question that says do you know anything local do you know any do you know of any uh let me find it and get back to it do you know of anything local, any programs that can teach us how to hunt and fish? Yeah, I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, and that's why I said, you know, this is such a, this is, it's so good. You know, I told you it was refreshing for me to hear, you know, like I said, you're talking through this with, you know, your congregation. This is what church is all about, right? Right. You think like, this is why you have your church. This is why you have your network. And ideally, even as a church, you guys have your plan and you know, like, hey, this guy in our congregation, this guy does this. He's good with this. If we need to get together, this is where we're going to meet. That's what our plans look like. So, I mean, of course, I can't, 
you know, like I told you, you know, I can tell you the mechanics of how you do this is, which is what I'm doing. You know, I kind of alluded to at the beginning, you know, the church, you know, can be a very powerful tool for survival, you know, because, you know, as you talk about this and know, like I said, it's a group of people that you trust, you know, you're going to take care of one another, you know, you know where you're going, you know, who's going to source what, you know, this is where it starts. And that's what it looks like. And, you know, as you know, you know, Bishop, as you start saying, hey, you know, this person is going to be responsible for this. This person is going to be responsible for going to get food. These folks are our builders. You know, in reality, you know, once everybody survives, I mean, I can't stress enough, you know, knowing where you're going, because at some point you're going to have to, you know, rebuild. Right. Um, so that was just my side on that. Now I keep coming back to that because. You know, that's at the heart of any plan that I made in special forces. That's at the heart of any plan I made in the infantry is to know where you're going, you know, having that plan before you go, because everybody got to know where they're going to get back to. You know, you have those strength and numbers. Um, now, if you if yeah. you are if you are in a in a situation where let's just say um, you don't have a place to go. Mm -hmm. um, and you sort of trapped yep. in the house and maybe we can maybe we can circle back around to that question i don't want to take you off of what you're yep. doing um you might be able to answer that now we can circle back to it but if you're caught and you can't get out um so what do you do for a source of food let's just say if you if you if you've been in the house for a while now and your your supply is getting low yep. so so should you have a supply somewhere that's already stored in, 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 in case of a situation like this? You know, yeah, so in, in, in case of when you're talking about like a shelter in place plan, and again, you know, it's always situational, situation dependent, you know, but what I think in a worst case, so I give you my personal experience, and I think I was telling you like with COVID, I mean, okay. it really, it's, it, it requires thinking out of the box, you know, thinking out of the box and knowing where you can go to get things, you know? So I knew that, you know, most people's inclination when COVID is to panic, right? So folks are gonna go to, folks are going to, you know, most folks, you know, ran the, you know, ran a Walmart. If you went to Walmart, you probably weren't able to find very much on the shelf. You know, you went to Target, you weren't able to find very much on the shelf. What I encourage my network to do, like, so folks who I was talking to is like, hey, you know, folks are in line, waiting in line, lines wrapped around Target, and a lot of your big box stores, you know, go and source from those small stores in your neighborhoods, you know, those, you know, you know, whatever neighborhood you're around, you know, you know, we all know those small local stores in our neighborhoods, those mom and pop shops, those mom and pop stores, those gas stations. And I tell you, you know, that's what we did, you know, also being able to go to the source. So I was telling you, you know, looking around commercial suppliers, you know, so, uh, you know, a lot of what, you know, we learn to do in special operations, right. It's just to think unconventionally. You know, you know, you know, coming up with these plans, thinking of these plans ahead of time, you know, so again, I can't enforce enough, you know, and we'll, and we, you know, we're talking about, you know, I, I will certainly, you know, answer the question about, you know, training. I'm making a note of that places you can go to get this training, but, you know, I wish I can give you like this tried and true, like, Hey, go to this place, go to this place, go to this place, you know? is really more trying to give you ways to think about, like, these are the things that I thought about. So, you know, when folks weren't able to get like toiletries and things like that, you know, I went to the local janitor supply place, you know, my wife went to the local janitor supply place. She was able to get, you know, buy it in bulk and get everything that she needs, right? You know, something so, you know, obviously if you had a Costco membership or something, you can go to Costco or things like that. But you know, really thinking about things that other people aren't thinking about, because if, if it's something that other, like it's going to be, people are going to be there, <laughs> you know, and when it comes in a time like this for survival, you know, you got to be first to get to wherever you're going to get in that case. Now, in terms of storing things up, obviously, you know, having non-perishables, um, 
you know, I, it, we, we have things in our covers and, I, and I'm careful because it, it depends on your budget, right? Everybody has a different budget. Um, so there are obviously things that you can do, like, uh, you know, if you have family, um, obviously you'll be able to source a lot of this stuff from your family, but that's why I started this off with like having a, you know, doing your own personal risk assessment and thinking about this beforehand so you don't get caught unawares. That makes sense. It makes sense. Um, did you have any other questions on the? No, I think that was it. Yeah, so someone asked about, you know, where do they go to get this training? Like I said, so certainly, you know, obviously, you know, within you within your church, you probably have a network and you can put together training on how to go out, you know, how to hunt, you know, how to get, a, you know, get into a deer stand. I don't know where, you know, these are things that are just like folks grow up learning how to do these different things, how to fish, Um you know, if somebody has a farm raising, so when you talk about getting meat, right? Again, those are things. Are there any farmers around you that you know? You know, are there any butcher shops? So there are so many things that come to my mind, you know, um, about, you know, how you can how you can get food without necessarily, you know, going to, you know, if your, your larger stores are out, like just putting some thought about like supporting those local establishments and going there. And then, like I said, once it's out, like once those things are out, obviously you're going to have to fall back on now. If you, and if you've exhausted your store supplies, you're going to have to fall back on these survival things. And I think about things like, um, you know, there are certainly several different, you know, survival schools and folks that do this. Obviously that comes at a cost. So if you know somebody who's able to teach you these things, then it's better to go through, go that route. But also like, uh, particularly for your young ones, um, you know, the Boy Scouts, things like that, you know, where they start, they have programs and they have these programs online that you can source. I, you know, you know, for those who, you know, you can learn just about anything on YouTube now. You know, so on YouTube, you can learn how to field strip an animal and how to go through, you know, you can learn how to, you can learn how to fish. You can learn how to use any of these kits. So that's where I would start. Um, so if there are no other questions, I'll keep moving through this list. Um, you know, the next thing I have on here, and I think we talked about, so um, pre-packaged rations. So like I said, having a box of MREs. That's what, so I have these things stored up because I'm military, right? So, you know, you know, I, you can buy, like I said, you can buy a box off of Amazon for like 80 bucks. You know, they come in a pack of, you know, whatever. Um, you know, you can buy other non-perishables in bulk, uh, but that's what I would look at for rations. You know, the next thing I have on here is, a, you know, first aid kit. Uh, this is going to be very important, particularly, you know, and I think of some of the things that you're certainly going to have if you're not used to being in a situation like that. You think about things like blisters that you're going to have to treat. You know, we have like, uh, you know, I've had young, young soldiers under my leadership before and we move long distances and, you know, every night, every evening we have to do foot checks, for example. You know, we have to do foot checks where we're like, hey, okay, you know, take your shoes off. We walk, you know, 20 miles or more. Let's look and see what this looks like. We have folks who are medical trained that'll come through, uh, bandage up, you know, their feet with like, uh, you know, we'll have like this mole skin that you'll put to, you know, to pad your feet against whatever, you know, boots or things that you're wearing. Um, you know, you're going to get cuts. You may end up getting, um, you know, cuts have, you know, cuts have the potential to get infected. So band-aids, antibiotics, you know, things like Neosporin. Um, and then, like I said, more severe injuries, you know, we've had guys that have walked and, you know, twisted ankles, falling in the holes if you're having to move through the woods or something like that. Um, so I can't stress enough first aid training. Uh, you can get basic first aid training from places like the Red Cross. And I think there are also places that give free first aid training, or you can probably schedule for somebody to come out to the church and provide first aid training. You know, those are certainly, you know, minor things that I'm talking about. Of course, you know, you know, you allude to the fact that, it, you know, folks on the street have weapons, folks get attacked, you know, so just knowing how to treat your most basic of wounds is very important, right? You know, and I hate to think, you know, you know, we think about the worst, but, you know, knowing how to treat 
knowing how to treat a gunshot wound, knowing how to treat, knowing how to treat a stab wound. Obviously, you know, you're going to try to get to, you know, some, you know, the medical, some medical provider as soon as possible. But, you know, understanding these basic first aid tasks can be the, you know, the difference between life and death. And, you know, in a survival situation where, you know, those medical, you know, professional medical help isn't readily available. Um, you know, so I have here the next thing we talk about protection. You know, you and I had a talk on the phone earlier, earlier this week, we were talking about protection, right? Um, and I think this is another one of those things that depends on your family situation. Um, and certainly, you know, a much deeper conversation to be had, but, you know, certainly a conversation to be had, particularly for those in the church, you know, so, you know, several different things you can look at in this case when it comes to protection, you know, whether you, you know, for home defense shotguns, you know, I think most folks uh, consider, you know, a shotgun to be one of the, you know, the best home defense um, weapons that you can have. Certainly there are folks who have more advanced weaponry. And I think, you know, that's really dependent on the person. There are certain, you know, certainly gun enthusiasts out there. Um, I don't advocate folks having those weapons unless they're trained to use them, because I think that's how we end up in a lot of the situations that we end up in. But certainly giving some thought to what you're going to do to protect yourself in case of emergency. Um, I think you notice generally whenever there's any type of emergency situation, then, you know, gun sales kind of go through the roof and everybody goes out to get a gun and that's fine. But I can't overstate, you know, the importance of making sure that you're trained to use, you know, whatever weapon that you have. I'm personally a fan of pepper spray, you know, and I put this here and you can see like you have these different, you know, you have the different mace here, you know, they're like low, low cost. And, you know, the reality of the situation you were talking about it, you and I were talking about it earlier is, you know, there are also, you know, the, the psychological implications that come with owning a gun, right? Or, or having to use a gun or having to deploy a gun and God forbid, anybody's ever in a position where they have to do that, but just understand that there is a psychological cost that comes, that may come with that, where, you know, something like this, this is what we call like non-lethal means of protecting yourself are very effective. And it really lowers the risk of one, something like, and I tell you, you know, soldiers even have these issues, what we call accidental you know, accidental discharges, you know, you know, you know, maybe your weapon not being on safety and you, safety and you, you fire off around accidentally, somebody getting accidentally hurt because they haven't, you know, not being properly trained or not being very comfortable, you know, with the weapon. Um, like I said, these are other options. You know, if you deploy this thing, you know, accidentally, like I said, it's very difficult to do that because of the safety mechanisms involved. But if you do, you know, no one loses their life. You know, if anything, you know, but, I, you know, certainly keep one of these things if you happen to be moving through the woods or something like that, because like I said, they, they are very effective deterrent against many, many wildlife, you know, that are out there. And they're also a very, very good deterrent on the street. Um, and it's something that, like I said, if you just so happen to have it stripped away from you, you know, it's it doesn't really become, it, it, it's not as much of a life-threatening situation as if you, you know, you lose your gun or you lose your knife. But I think when we think about ways to protect ourselves, you know, gun, knife, certainly, you know, lethal ways, you know, lethal means. But then, you, can, you know, like I said, think about something like this or other non-lethal means like a taser. You know, I'm not really a fan of tasers because it means, you know, for a taser, you got to really get on up close that means somebody's got to be up close on you, and I'm a fan of keeping my keeping your distance. Uh, but again, these are the things that you learn in training. Do you uh, do you mm -hmm. do you um like one more than the other? Pepper spray or mace? I know they're not the same. I guess um, mm -hmm. that's why they call them mm -hmm. mace and pepper spray. So, which would you prefer, one over the other? Which one? 
So I think this pepper spray is what you can, I have to look at the legalities behind them and that's why I'm careful and I'm kind of using them synonymously, but you know, what I'm saying here, what you can get, you know, what you can get here, you know, this is all I, what I got from Amazon. Gotcha. And, you know, I know plenty of folks carry this pepper spray <laughs> with them. You know, like I would carry it. I used to carry it. So when I lived in North Carolina, I would run on these roads, on these back roads and it would be dark. And I'd always have an issue with dogs getting after me, you know? So this was something that was easy for me to carry as opposed to trying to run with a, with a pistol or something on me, you know? Uh, this is something that can be kept in a purse, something that can be kept in your pocket. But the other thing I want to mention on this is I can't stress enough the importance of whatever it is that you're carrying, making sure that you're on the right side of the law and that you understand the legalities of whatever it is, whether that be, you know, whether that be a pistol or whatever you're carrying, you know, it's really good to go through, you know, concealed carry training. You know, because as you're going through that training, every state has its own set of laws. You know, um, you know I initially went through, um, you know, concealed carry classes in North Carolina. And I know that, so going through then, you know, you'll get a card saying that, you know, you can carry your weapon. Uh, because without that card, then there are all kinds of rules that you have. Like when you carry your, a weapon on you in your car, if you're moving from place to place, uh, how you have to carry that weapon. So, you know, ignorance of the law is not a viable defense. I'm sure there's something that, you know, you know, folks have heard. So, you know, going through a training like that, they will make sure that you're able to use whatever it is that you have, you know, make sure that you're on the right side of the law when you're carrying it. Um, Cause I, you know, I have to assume that even if we're in some type of survival situation that, you know, you know, we will try to get back to a hold to the rule of law. And I think you're kind of seeing that. I think you're kind of seeing that play out on the news now, you know? Um, yeah. So I think those are my thoughts on that. Now, you, you, you have any other questions, any comments on that? Um, I don't see any in the chat box, so we can keep rolling. Okay. Yeah. So here, um, goes by different names, 550 cord, you know, parachute cord, paracord. But having a roll of this, we'd always carry this wherever we went. And this is just like just being able to, and like everybody's gonna have different levels of training with like what type of knots and things they can tie. But I tell you, the, the, this is very useful, you know, for even for things like just hanging your laundry to dry, you know, stringing this out between trees and, um, like I said, if you have, like we talked about that space blanket, you know, if you don't have a tent or something happens to your tent, or if, you know, you don't have a sleeping bag, then you can string a, a cord up like this low against a tree. You can drape your uh, space blanket over the top, and then you have protection from the elements, you know, you know, from the rain or what have you. So this is just a very useful tool. Okay, before we move, there's a question in the chat box that says, what kind of all weather type clothing is preferred to be packed in the emergency kit uh, type of material. Yep, so with, uh, you know, so one of the things I have on my list here, we talk about, so I advocate for, and we'll get to a picture of some of these things as we go. Okay. Um, again, it is situation dependent. It depends on what time of year you're in right? It, all of these things go into a factor, but I generally always have some type of waterproof jacket, just a rain jacket. Um, you could have, you know, some folks had waterproof, you know, water resistant pants. I wasn't a fan of those because I felt like they made me very hot and that they would slow me down. So I would always have like a, a rain jacket. Um, I would have, you know, depending on, so for one, there's something what we call like a layer system, right? You want to be able to wear layers. So generally, um, I would start with, you know, I would start with something I can wear under my shirt. So like a waffle top or like a, and this is just specifically for the cold, a, uh, like a long john shirt. And I would start with that because if you're moving, you know, you know you're moving these long distances, you're going to get hot. So I would always start with that. And as I got warm, I could just pull my sleeves up on my, uh, 
on my, my waffle top or my long john shirt or what have you. Uh, if it got really cold, I can wear like a long john bottoms under my pants or, you know, something I can stop and strip down. And then you just layer up from there. Um, I tell you one good piece of material though, you know, um, generally didn't use this unless it got really cold. And when I was, so like, for example, when I was stationed in New York, um, you know, at uh, Fort Drum, it was snow there most of the, you know, for a lot of the year, it's snow and we would still have to go out and train there when, you know, certain parts of places where I've been deployed where, you know, you're having to go out in the snow. So uh, an equipment, uh, a fabric called Gore-Tex, you know, Gore-Tex is, you know, very lightweight and I don't have it on our list, but I can add this and send it to you um, after the call and I can actually send some. So, but Gore-Tex, these things can get very expensive. But the good thing about these types of material is that they are, you know, they keep you warm and they dry fast. What I absolutely recommend against outside of your socks in the cold is anything that's like wool, <laughs> wool jackets, things like that, because they're going to retain moisture. They're not going to dry as fast. They're going to yeah. slow you down. You know, they're going to have this smell once, you know, like once moisture and things set in, particularly if you have to go through some type of water. Like if you have to go through, like if you have to swim across somewhere, you know, it's just going to take forever for it to dry. And it's just going to, it's going to, you're going to be miserable, you know. So I would try to stick to any type of material that dries quickly and allows you to continue to move without, like without chafing you or without causing you discomfort. So I hope that answers that, that question well enough. And you know, like I said, if you have a follow-up, you know, feel free to ask and I can expound. Um, you know, the next thing I have here is work gloves. You know, gloves, um, you know, for anybody who's been, anybody who's familiar, you know, been in the woods, you know, whether you, you know, whether you hunt or you just like, you know, Eagle Scouts, or you're just an outdoors person, you understand the importance of being able to have something that protects your hands. And it's just understanding like what you're, as you're moving, if you're in a position where you have to move through the woods or something like that, you know, having these heavy duty gloves where you're having to move through, move branches out of the way, you know, you got things like thorns, you're having to move, you're having to Let's say you got to build something. Let's say you get to a point, you're in a survival situation. I'm just imagining what could potentially happen. And now let's say, okay, we survived for these few days. We've, you know, we've linked up where we're going to go. And now we got to, you know, build something, you know, now, you know, so if you have to chop down something or, you know, you're going to need these work gloves to protect your hands. And generally speaking, you know, you want to protect your hands because your hands are very susceptible to cuts and getting infected. So I always move wherever it, it requires a lot of discipline because it, it does, you can get hot and it does get uncomfortable. And I can attest to that, but I can also attest to like earlier in my career, not wearing, you know, being young, moving, you know, beating through the woods, going places and, you know, not having uh, gloves on because, you know, you know, I couldn't, you know, they weren't dexterous, dexterous enough. I couldn't move. I couldn't move like I wanted to, but then I had all these cuts and, you know, like I said, this infection and not to gross everybody out, but that's just the reality of what can happen. Like I said, if you don't take care of yourself in a situation like that. Okay. Now, um, here's a question and we might be coming up on it. Okay. But, um, it says, I don't think I saw this yet, but for home defense, what kind of whistle or sound tool can be used if an intruder enters your home? Yeah, so everybody has a different, everybody has a different thought on this, right? So I think any, you know, any whistle, and I think a whistle, so when we talk about this plan, right? And that's why I say, you know, it, every family has to have their own plan Right. You know, and I've done this with my family before, you know, but it's just because, you know, a lot of people don't feel like it's needed, but I'm always like, you know, what if, what if somebody comes in my house in the middle of the night, I need my family to kind of know what to do. So now my family just, they're just really just, you know, being a military family for, for 20 years, you kind of just, it kind of becomes a drill for you. Um, 
So I think that, you know, something like a whistle, I think a whistle is good. And I have it on our list here because I think that it's good in the outdoors if you're trying to alert, if you're trying to alert people or you're trying to alert people like, hey, I need help. Um, but when it comes to home defense, my opinion, right? I think the most effective thing that you can do to deter I mean, again, there are layers to this plan, right? Obviously, you want to make, you want to announce yourself, make yourself, you know, you try to do what you can to deter the threat. You know, generally speaking, if, you know, I would, I would like to think that if somebody is breaking into your home, you know, in the case of a robber, maybe they're thinking that you're not home, right? But in the case there is somebody that's breaking in your home to do you harm, <laughs> you know, uh, which I mean, we've seen, you know, if you've watched movies, you've seen examples of this and you hate to think that it plays out, but, you know, having some type of personal protection, I think in this case, I personally have a shotgun, right? And not trying to tiptoe around this thing, but I kind of told you like, you know, my thoughts on it, everybody kind of feels different about it. I'm cautious when I make certain recommendations because I do feel like if you're going to have these things, I've trained with these things for a great, the greater part of a decade. I've been shooting since I was a kid too, you know? So for me, I just know what I'm doing, right? So, you know, I, you know, one of the things I was talking to you earlier, so there's this common knowledge of, okay, you know, the best thing that you can use is, and then we can talk about, so if you're gonna use a shotgun, I also have thoughts on pump action versus automatic, you know, having trained with these things extensively. I'm not a fan of pump action shotguns for novices, right? Because for one, you're already going to be scared. <laughs> you know, the next thing, you probably don't know what you're doing. And so, you know, my thing is much easier to train with an automatic, an automatic, this is just my two cents. Now, like I said, you may have some other, you know, aficionados or, you know, folks who have a different thought about, you know, how you use these different weapons. But I certainly think a, you know, something like, certainly if you think that a pump act, like the pump of a shotgun is going to de de uh, deter uh, a, a criminal coming into your house. I mean, I think that's, if you're talking about a sound to deter, yeah, you know, that's probably the best sound. I, you know, you can use a whistle that may work. Like I said, you have a whistle, use a whistle. You can, if you have a pump action shotgun, use the pump, you know, but I think you have to, if you're going to have a weapon, you got to be prepared to use it, <laughs> right? And I think that's where training comes in. And I think having the right type of round, so like definitely a home defense round in your shotgun, where if you have to fire off that warning shot, if you have to fire off that shot towards, um, and it also comes like, you have to think about like how your home set up. Does most of your family sleep upstairs and you can kind of set things like, you know, th these are things that you, you learn as you're training, right? With training, you know, do you have a flat, you know, are all your family going to meet you at this part of the house if an intruder comes in? That's why it's important to think through that plan. Like that's not necessarily, I mean, all of this is survival. We can certainly get into this if this is what your folks want to get into. Um, but I think that I am an advocate of making sure whatever you do that you have, like I said, that you, you know, whether you're going to have a handgun, whether you're going to have a shotgun, that you've gone through the proper training and that you have the proper license for your weapon. Do you so, think so, that answers that? Yeah. So, so Jeremy, tell us, let's say a scenario where we're properly trained. Mm -hmm. um, what type of handguns would you suggest? Now, wow. there's, and, and men and women is going to be different. Some can do the same, but tell us why one um, particular handgun might be better for a female um, than another one would be. Right. So again, I'm going to preface this with these are my thoughts. Okay. And it's not to say that a woman can't do anything that a man can do. Right. And I will also tell you that this isn't gender specific, right? It's certainly because if you, I can tell you that I know I've trained with a number of ladies who can outshoot me, <laughs> you know, because if you train, you're trained. It doesn't matter whether you're male, you're female, right? I think, you know, your body type, your size, I think those are the most important things when it comes to selecting 
a weapon. I think your experience. So akin to the same analogy I gave you with the shotgun on whether you use a pump action brother, whether you use versus whether you use an, an automatic, right? The same thing kind of goes with, you know, when we start talking about handguns, you know, what handguns have different calibers of rounds, you know, handguns have different model specifications. So, you know, a full size versus a compact versus a subcompact. Um, you know, I personally carry, you know, I have several different, but I think, you know, I'm personally most comfortable with my nine millimeter, right? I've used it, I've deployed with it, <laughs> you know, I train with it. I can shoot the thing with my eyes closed. I can shoot the thing blindfolded. Like, you know, you know, if something happens, I've, I've used it in the dark. I'm just that comfortable with my weapon, right? And I think that that is just the, that is the most important thing that whatever you have, that you be comfortable with it. So, um, but I will say that I think a nine millimeter caliber is enough. You know, I think a lot of folks, when I hear folks saying that they're going out and they're getting a 40, 45, you know, these larger, I think it kind of becomes an ego, right? Because, um, and I think I shared the story with, a, a, I think I shared with you the story of a friend of mine who went and got, you know, a, a high caliber um, handgun um, and, I, and I, with the purpose of carrying it in her purse. And uh, she got that advice from a friend. And I think, you know, I was, I was personally disheartened because I feel like, you know, for one, if you've never, for one, if you've never been in a situation where you're going to have to use that weapon, you're going to be nervous. You're going to be scared. You're probably going to be second guessing yourself. And it's not going to play out the way you're going to, you think it's going to play out. You know, that's why training is so important. You know, I know we'd all like to think that I'm going to have the time and I'm going to be able to get into my purse or I'm going to be able to get into, you know, whatever. And there's so many factors that go into play if you're not trained. But like I said, to, to your point, if you're trained, I think you can use, I think you can use whatever, right? I think it also becomes situation dependent. It becomes, you know, what you're using, what you're using this, this, this weapon for. But I think you should be able to deter someone within the first one or two rounds, right? And I think ideally, again, just my two cents, the goal is to, I'm always a fan of deterrence. Um, but just understand that, you know, if you have this weapon, you have, and like I said, that's why, I, you know, I gave you the option of pepper spray. But, you know, if you, you know, if you have this weapon, be prepared to use it. <laughs> and I just understand you know, and I'm sure most folks are, but just understand that you also have to live with the impacts of using that weapon. And I'm sure you've seen over the course of the years that our country's been at war, things like PTSD, and not to get into a long conversation about PTSD, but these are real things. Just understand that there are, you know, these psychological consequences that come after being in a stressful situation like that. Does that answer your question? Is there something I need to, is there something I didn't answer well enough? I think, yeah. um, I think it's, it's, it's good. I think you did good. Okay. Um, yeah. Now, mm -hmm. I, I think if you don't mind, yeah. um, we might have to come back and do a part two. Okay. Certainly. Um, because it's, it's important for me to make sure all of us get this down and we understand what we're looking at. Um, I have, I've written down a bunch of things that we haven't gotten to yet. So I want you to know tonight that um, you may have some questions and there's some things that you might be thinking. We won't get to it all tonight, but if Jeremy is available next week, we're gonna come back. Now, um, next week, if he can come back, um, and we do part two, there may be something that um, me and Ray might be able to show you next week. We got to see if it comes in um, between now and next week. Hopefully it does. If, if we do, um, I'll have Ray on standby to actually show it to you, uh, something that you can look at, something we've talked about, but you'll get a good idea of, of what you really need and we can give you 
the right resources to where you could actually go get this. Um, so, um, but keep keep going. We got another we got another five to seven minutes, and um, where we're going right now with these shoes that's important as well. Yeah, yeah. So, like I said, I'm just walking down my list here. You know, so one of the things I'm going to, you know, before I get here, so um, I don't have, a, I don't necessarily have a picture of this, but again, everybody has a different situation regarding their health. Making sure that you've stored up enough medication of whatever it is that you take that is going to be able to last you to a point where you can get back to either a pharmacist or get back to see your doctor. I can't overstate that enough. Um, also keeping cash on hand. Like I said, this is also dependent on your budget. Um, everybody has a different situation. Uh, but I would personally, like, I would always like to keep, a, you know, a couple of dollars of different denominations on me, you know, wherever I go. I think you should also think about in a survival situation. Now, this sounds unorthodox, right? But always, but keeping something outside of cash on you that's value, you know, that may be of val of some value, or something that, you know, I think most of us have this anyway. You know, like you know, a lot of us have like a nice, a nice watch or something like that, like our, our, our you know, our Apple Watch or something. You know, you know, for me, in a lot of the places where, and it's not necessarily applicable unless you really get into <laughs> dire straits. I think. But, you know, it just made me think about one of the things, like one of the tactics that I've used, particularly, you know, working in foreign countries is I like to keep something that, you know, just in case I'm out of cash, things that I can, I can trade, right? Probably won't get to that situation here in the U.S., but just, again, another thing to think about, just something to think that one thing that came to the, you know, the back of my mind. You know, another thing that I would say before I dive here back into gear is making sure that you have copies of your important papers. You know, like I said, so whether that is, um, you know, whether those are, like I said, your, your permits, but also things like if things get very bad, you know, as things begin to return to some sense of normalcy, like deeds to your property, anything can happen, right? So making sure that you got, you know, all of those important papers where you can come back and say, hey, this was mine, this is what I have, this is who I am, here's my passport, Here's my social security card. Here's my birth certificate. You know, um, have copies of those things. Can't say exactly, you know, we don't know what can happen, but I think this is an important thing. And I wanted to make sure that I address those three things, medications, cash, and important paperwork sealed up, like I said, in some waterproof bag or something so that it's not ruined and stuffed down into your backpack you know, before we got off of the call tonight. So That's I think important. important. Um, that was something that I didn't think of. I have a bunch of stuff wrote down, but that was something that I didn't think of. And so um, thank you for bringing that piece out because a lot of times that's, that would probably be the last thing that we think of, thinking that once we leave, we won't come back. But if we come back, who's to say um, that you're going to be allowed to go back on your premises, even though you know it belongs to you, but you have to show some form of idea or say, hey, this is mine in here. I can prove it. So um, that was good that you brought that out. Yeah. Um, how much time do you do you still want me to keep moving forward? Or you want to stop here? Is this really up to you? Let's, let's stop here. Okay. And what I would ask everyone to do tonight, based on what you've heard so far, um, Jeremy still has some stuff he has to go through. And we're gonna come back and we'll do this next week and we'll finish it up. But whatever questions you have, I would that you would send it to me in um, an email. Um, T, if you can put the email uh, email in the chat box. Um, so if we have any guests that, that's not normally with us, um, you might be able to send us your questions or what you think, um, some questions that you have that you wanna ask just in case if you can't be back on next week, We'll make sure you get this information, but um, we want to have that. Um, there it is. You can send any questions um, to that um, um, website, email address, and we'll make sure we get them and we'll make sure we bring them up um, next week. And so, um, again, this is, this, is, this is important. I pray that we never have to use this, but it's always better to be prepared um, if you do, 
because the last thing you want to do is be in a situation where you're unprepared. And then when you're in an unprepared situation, it's like, well, what do I do now? Um, well, you're in, a, you're in a bad time to be saying that now. Um, so like Jeremy said, we have to run through things. Those of you who have, have heard here tonight, if you, if you have situations where you got plans, um, it's always good to have those plans. You go over those plans with those who are living in the household. If a fire breaks out, what do you do? Or if there's a meeting place, if, if one is somebody's downstairs, somebody's upstairs, um, all of that needs to be discussed. Um, one of the things that we purchased um, last week was a one of those ropes that if you're on a third floor, you can stick out of the window and let it down and you're able to get out just in case if you're trapped on the third floor with a fire or something. So there's so many different scenarios that sometimes we don't think about, but I'm trying to help as many as I can during this global pandemic. Uh, I want to make sure that we're empowered um, and that we get as much knowledge as possible. And so we got to start tonight and I want to thank Jeremy for um, um, making some time tonight for us to come and share with some of the knowledge that he have. But we're going to come back again next week. Um, and we're going to finish going through this. And I think it's very important that you come back and maybe invite some friends to come back and, and be a part of this because you just, you just never know what's going to happen. This is always best to be prepared in unexpected situations. So with that being said, um, Jeremy, I'm going to give you um, a few minutes to just um, give us some closing remarks and then we'll come back and we'll finish this next week. Thanks. Yeah, I wasn't able to unmute myself. Okay. Um, yeah, so again, you know, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I hope this was helpful. And I think you hit the, I think you hit the nail on the head. You know, you know, I, like I said, the, the key things I want to get across is, you know, we'll make sure, we'll certainly make sure that, you know, you have the stuff that you need, that you need to put into your backpack. But I can't stress enough, you know, the training the rehearsal, rehearse, 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 because you can have all of these things in your pack, you can be ready to go. But then it's like, hey, for one, if you don't know where you're going, <laughs> you know, it's, it doesn't matter. If you're not trained to do what you're gonna need to do when you get where you're going, it doesn't matter, right? And then just remembering that, you know, as much as we would like to, you know, we got limited budgets, limited time, you can't train for everything. You know, just focus your efforts, uh, you know, initially on those things that are, you know, like the most probable things, those things that are the most severe if they were to happen, and then you build out from there. And like I said, I can certainly make myself available next week to close this discussion out. How, if you have any other questions or however else I can be of assistance, don't hesitate to let me know. Okay, so as we close out, I want to ask all of those who are watching tonight to give Jeremy a shout out. Um, to thank him. He'll be back next week, but thank him for what he shared with us tonight. And while you are thanking him, I just want to say to all of you who are watching, uh, one of the things that my dad taught me as we were growing up, he said, never bring your car home on empty. So um, I know sometimes and, and we're, we're coming home and we're tired and we say, well, I'll get it tomorrow. I'll stop tomorrow and fill it up. Well, you don't know if you're going to have to roll out in the middle of the night and um, you don't have the gas that you need. So make sure that you keep your car on full at all times. And um, so thank you for all the shout outs. And is Michael Sturdivant on tonight? Uh, okay, maybe not. Um, I wanna give him a big shout out for making an introduction to me and Jeremy. Um, and so our relationship will grow from this point on. So we'll be back next week um, to talk about some of this. That's, let me tell you something. Uh, maybe you think, oh, I don't need to come back on next week um, because I, I pretty much got it in my head. I would say you probably don't because there's still a lot of things that we did not discuss that you really need to hear. Um, and so I, I would urge you to come back on next week. Think about some things. 
Um, give it some thought and put your questions in and we'll be prepared next week to, to um, answer them. And I'm sure during the course of now and next Thursday, uh, Jeremy will have probably some other stuff he wants to share with us besides what he shared with us tonight and what he didn't get to share with us. So we're all we're trying to do is empower you to be better and be prepared. And so for those of you watching, thank you again. And if there's a subject that you would like for us to talk about, please email us. Uh, we will be glad to try to bring it to you. And again, thank you. And so until next Thursday night, we'll see you here. Same time, same place, same guest. Thanks, Jeremy. All right. Thanks, Bishop. Thanks for having me. All right. Good night. Those who you're watching by Facebook and those who are watching by Zoom. We love you. See you next week.